Hello and welcome to Paradise Wildlife Park. My name is Aaron and I'm joined by our head keeper James and two of the most Hello. unique animals that we have here at Paradise. James, for those that haven't seen this species before, what exactly are we with right now? Uh, so we're currently with our lowland tapirs or our Brazilian tapirs or even known as the South American tapir. And uh, these guys come from, obviously from South America. They live in the Amazon rainforest, they live in the Pantanal. Uh, they're found in lots of different countries uh, in South America. Um, and I say they're known as the tapir. Uh, tapir is closer relatives of horses and rhinos, but still distant relatives. Um, now there's four different types of tapirs in the world. Uh, there's three from South and Central America, and there's one from Asia. Uh, now back in 2013, they thought they might have found a, first, a fifth species called Cobamani tapir. But at the moment, uh, they're still doing a bit more research on that to work out if it is actually a separate species uh, or just try and find out exactly uh, where this information has come from. Um, now they're strict herbivores, so as you can see in this trough here, they've got a wide range of all different fruit and vegetables. Uh, and this is actually their second meal of the day. Uh, so uh, they get a nice varied diet. Uh, we give them a, a nice varied mixture of uh, vegetables. Now they don't really get much fruit, uh, just to try and uh, be safe to their teeth, uh, because obviously we've got to look after and make sure they have the best care possible. Uh, so the less sugar we can give them uh, is helps their teeth uh, as they go, because obviously we can't get in there and brush their teeth daily, like uh, twice daily like we would. Uh, so we give them a lot more root vegetables that helps to clean their teeth. Uh, we give them branches as well, which they'd eat all the bark from, all the leaves from, and that helps keep their teeth in good condition. And now with the tapirs as well, you might see uh, one of the unique factors about the tapirs is that lovely long nose of theirs. Now that nose is called a proboscis, uh, and this is a prehensile muscular trunk. Uh, so your Tamara here is uh, showing it nicely, and uh, she'll use this to help move, fo uh, move food into her mouth. She'll use it as a snorkel uh, to hook over branches and pull down into their mouths as well. So it's like that little multi-tool. Now, as Aaron said, we've got our two. Uh, so the one closest to me here uh, is called Tamara, uh, and Tamara is our daughter. And, uh, and then we have uh, her dad next door to him, uh, next door to her, called Tomoko. Um, now, Tomoko came here as part of a breeding program. He lived here, uh, he's been here at Paradise Wild Park now since 2001. Uh, so he's uh, been here for quite a long time. Uh, he was part of uh, the breeding program, the e European breeding program, uh, where he was paired up with a uh, female called Gabrielle, uh, who unfortunately uh, was no longer here with us anymore. But uh, they were very successful and had four successful offspring as part of that breeding program, and Tamara being their fourth. So at the moment, we've just got them as companion animals uh, because uh, Tomoko has bred so well uh, in the past. He's actually even got grandkids at other collections around uh, the UK and even Europe. Uh, so he's a very good uh, representative for the breeding program. So we've actually stopped breeding from him now um, because actually an, uh, they're part of the breeding programs in the wild. The lowland tapir here are actually classed as a vulnerable species. Uh, so this means their, their numbers are dying out in the wild. And uh, unfortunately, all four species of tapirs are either vulnerable or endangered. I say this species class is vulnerable and then you have the other three species which are the Malayan tapir. They're the largest, they're the black and white in markings. Uh, you might have seen them at a few other zoos in the UK, Edinburgh Zoo, uh, London Zoo, uh, Portland. Uh, so quite a few different zoos uh, have them as well. Uh, and then you have a species called the Baird's tapir. Uh, they come from Costa Rica, Belize, more Central America. And then you, uh, I say you have the lowland and then you have the mountain tapir. Now the mountain tapir is the most endangered. Uh, they actually come from Ecuador and Colombia. Uh, and they're also known as the woolly tapir because they're found higher up in the Andes mountains. So they've got a bigger, thicker, woollier coat. And James, you spent a bit of time in Brazil working with tapir conservationists. Can you just explain to us what the biggest threats are facing tapirs and also what some of the efforts were that you saw going on in Brazil? To yeah. Help save them? Yeah, so here, here at uh, Zoological Society of Hertfordshire, uh, we've fundraised and support tapir conservation now for quite a few years. And as you said, yeah, we're very lucky to go out uh, at the end of last year uh, to work with one of the charities that we've supported for a few years now called the Lowland Tapir Conservation Initiative. Uh, and working with uh, uh, the conservation, conservationists out there who are some of the leading conservationists in the tapir field. And uh, it was amazing to actually see tapirs in a natural habitat and the work that's going in to protect them. Uh, now, some of the threats, as uh, you're asking there, is uh, habitat destruction. Habitat destruction is one of the main threats for the tapirs in the wild. Uh, these guys live in rainforests, they live in uh, the Pantanal. Unfortunately, these areas are being destroyed for farming, uh, for either sugarcane or even for cattle ranching. Uh, you may have also seen uh, uh, last year as well, the Amazon fires as well. Uh, unfortunately, fires are sometimes set deliberately to clear land, uh, but unfortunately, sometimes they get out of control and that affects the tapirs, their food source, their habitats they live in uh, as well. 
Uh, unfortunately, they are hunted in certain areas as well uh, for their meat and for their skin, uh, so that has a big problem for them. And uh, actually, a surprising one uh, is actually road traffic accidents. Uh, now, tapirs here, they're uh, known as either crepuscular or nocturnal animals, so they move around at night time. Uh, so they move across the rainforests uh, in their te uh, territories during this time. Uh, but as the logging trade is happening, they're putting these big highways through the rainforest that the tapirs are trying to cross. And unfortunately, large lorries, large vehicles traveling at high speeds, uh, unfortunately, they do find uh, tapir deaths on, on the side of the road. So it's a, it's a real shame. But some of the work that they're doing um, in the area that I went into, into the Pantanal is there's a high number of tapir uh, road traffic accidents there. But they're actually looking at doing research of where the main areas are uh, so they can actually contact the government and the stakeholders for uh, the travel, uh, the road, the people that put the roads in to actually see if they can put bridges in or uh, change speed limits and all different bits like that. So the work they're doing out there is really important and the research they're doing to try and find more and more out about these fantastic animals. Now James, obviously they look quite big. How much the tapirs weigh? Uh, so yeah, they are, are quite a nice size, gentle giants. Uh, but uh, as you say, these guys are actually the second smallest of all four uh, species of the tapirs. And uh, Tamara here, she's actually our heaviest. So males are uh, males are always smaller than females. So uh, Tamara is actually bigger than her dad. She weighs in around about 230 kilos uh, at a maximum, average around 220. Uh, and dad weighs in at 200 kilos. So to make sure they're nice and healthy, uh, we weigh them here at Paradise uh, once a month uh, and that ensures that we give them the best care possible. Uh, we can ensure their diet is correct uh, and we're maintaining to uh, hopefully uh, if we spot any uh, changes in their weight we can actually uh, help them and get any veterinary treatment if we needed to. And can you just explain to people what some of the unique features are that tapirs have? Yeah, uh, so as I said, uh, they've got that lovely long nose, uh, so this lovely proboscis here, uh, which is one of their unique factors. Uh, but then if you were to look up the side of, uh, say, Tomoko here, he has this very stylish uh, Mohican. Now this isn't there for fashion, uh, this is actually there for protection. Uh, and this is called a mantle muscle. Uh, and Brazilian tapirs, the lowland tapir, this species here, uh, is the most has the most prominent uh, mantle muscle out of all four species of tapir. Uh, the others don't really have it there. Uh, but the tapir, uh, lowland tapir, like this has it such a large one because jaguars would be their main predator uh, and jaguars actually attack their prey from the back of the neck where you see uh, lions tigers leopards they always go for the juggler or try and suffocate their prey but actually the jaguars got such a strong jaw pressure they actually go for the vertebrae and they go for the back of the neck there to try and break the vertebrae in one bite uh, to bring their prey down so this solid muscle helps protect that uh, and you can see with their body shape they've got a very a long slender head and then that big weighty uh, behind uh, which they use uh, to help charge their way through the rainforest. Uh, so these guys can actually run up to speeds of up to 30 miles an hour to get uh, avoid predators. So what they'll do, they'll charge through the undergrowth. Uh, the head can go through any small little gap in the bushes uh, and the big old weighty behind uh, smashes on through behind uh, them to get them through uh, the thick undergrowth that can be found in the, uh, um, the habitats they come from. Um, what is a baby tapir called? So a baby tapir is a tapir calf. Uh, and they'll have one baby tapir near enough every two years naturally in the wild. Uh, a tapir's gestation period is up to 13 months, so quite a long time. And they'll only normally give birth to one single tapir. Um, so I say it's quite a slow reproductive cycle compared to, say, if you look at some other animals, say that like, even like spring now, so you've got a lot of sheep and lambs being born over the place, but sheep can have two, even up to three lambs every year. Where well, tapirs have one calf near enough every two years in the wild. Um, so I say one baby calf, when they're first born, they're about the size of their head. Uh, so they're quite small uh, and then the female uh, looks after that baby and brings that baby up herself. The male will still hang around in areas but won't, won't really do any of the upbringing of the baby. Uh, it's all down to the female. So that's why the females have to be bigger and stronger. And do the babies look any different when they're first born? Yeah. The, the, the adults as well? Yeah, the babies are really cute when they're first born. Not to say the adults aren't cute either. Uh, but when babies are first born, they're covered in white spots and stripes. Uh, and this is for camouflage reasons. So as I say, uh, naturally, uh, mum has to bring up that baby on her own. So while she goes out foraging for food, uh, she'll leave the baby in a big thick undergrowth. Uh, so the spots and stripes have actually help break up the coloration and use it for camouflage purposes to hide away from any predators. Uh, so as that baby then starts getting bigger uh, and grows up older, uh, they, don't need, uh, they, don't, they don't need the spots and stripes anymore. Uh, so they slowly start to fade out and they become the more solid color that you see these guys here. But as they get older, they still will keep some spots on them uh, so, and some white parts. So if you actually look at the tips of their ears here, uh, you can see they've actually both got white tips to their ears 
So every tapir will have these and they're actually different to every tapir, so it's like, almost like a version of our fingerprint. And sometimes females uh, will actually keep spots on the inside of their back legs and on their belly. Uh, and this is believed so when the calves start to follow mum around, they can identify by their mum's by these markings as well. And uh, they look, obviously being such a large species, are they fairly slow? Uh, say so they're not too slow. They can, when you just see them motion around the enclosure, uh, they just slowly trundle around. Uh, but when they want to pick up some speed, I say up to 30 miles an hour is the top speed that these guys can get up to uh, on short spurts. So yeah, they can move very fast. And say the way they're designed, uh, just the weight, the weight on the back end, their head just goes down and they just charge around. Now sometimes if you come back and see us when we're open, uh, you actually see on a nice sunny day, a bit like today, uh, when they're in and out of the pool, you'll see them actually charging around the enclosure, jumping in. To the swimming pool, uh, and actually, you'll see them actually get up to quite fast speeds. And as I said, they've got to swim pool because tapirs are actually sort of known as semi aquatic animals, really. So, they love the water, and I said that's one of the reasons why they have that lovely long nose, uh, which they can use as a snorkel. Uh, so, they have a water, they have the uh, swimming pool here where they can go into, they can go bathe, they can swim around in. Uh, and actually, uh, tapirs also go to the toilet in the water as well, so that's where they, they'll uh, actually go to the toilet and pass their feces. Awesome, thank you so much, James. Uh, do these guys like scratches and tiggles? Yes, the tapirs love a good scratch. Uh, so they have some favourite spots. So Tim here, right underneath the chin. So you can see he's actually now sticking out, uh, lifting up that top lip. And he actually starts to close his eyes and almost fall asleep. So they really do love a, a scratch and a tickle. And it's actually one of uh, a really a favourite thing of theirs. Uh, and so much so that we actually use it to, uh, to actually help us uh, give the tapirs the best care possible. Because where we can give them scratches and tickles, uh, we can do health checks over them. So we can easily stroke all over their body. Uh, they'll actually roll over sometimes. And uh, so we can uh, scratch their bellies and enjoy a big belly rub, uh, which actually allows us to check all the underside, check their feet and make sure they're nice and healthy as well. And also, to help us bring uh, the vets in, uh, we also get tapirs used to strangers coming in as well. So you may actually know that we uh, do an experience here called Tickle Tapir Experience, where you can actually, uh, once we're open again, come back and meet our tapirs, where you can come purchase an experience for either yourself or a family member as a gift, and you can come in and meet the tapirs. It's a half hour session where you get to come in here, give them a real good tickle, uh, and now she have roll over and enjoy their belly scratched. And that actually, actually helps us uh, to get them used to strangers. So if we need to bring a vet in, a vet nurse, they're used to not just us keepers, that they're used to every single day, uh, but very strangers as well coming in, so it makes it a lot easier and less stressful for them. All right, now one thing that's obviously really important to help us with regards to conservation work, where we're supporting obviously tapir conservation, but also the welfare and just people learning about this amazing species is obviously sharing this video because the more people that know about this species, the better chance we have of obviously protecting these guys in the wild and obviously taking care of them better here at the wildlife park as well. Um, obviously, during this time, we hope everyone at home is staying safe. Um, we hope the coronavirus pandemic hasn't been affecting you too badly. Um, and, but obviously in the meantime, we are staying open because uh, in terms of us coming in to take care of the animals because we are key workers and obviously we do need to come in and take care of them. But obviously one thing that is a real struggle is the fact we're not open to the general public. So we don't really have any income at the moment, but it is costing us thousands of pounds to look after the animals um, every single day. So if anyone out there is willing to help us in any way, please visit our Just Giving page. Just go to justgiving.com and then Animal Support Fund or our website pwpark.com in order to make donations. Um, in the meantime, we're gonna be here taking care of the animals, but we do look forward to welcoming you back to paradise when obviously the coronavirus pandemic is over. Um, but of course, in the meantime, stay home and stay safe. Take care, everyone. Bye, guys.